presentation by Rochelle Podkar, a fiction writer and poet from India, and international writing program guest. She will be speaking on putting childhood back into the child, rights and realities of children in India. I am Sandra Morrow, board member and program committee member of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council and host for today's program. ICFRC hosts programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members and volunteers for their dues and contributions that have made this forum possible since 1983. I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs and the University of Iowa's honors program. They contribute vital time, talent, and logistics to our organization. I would also like to thank the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support, and I thank today's financial sponsors, Midwest One Bank, and Dave, Denise, and Mike Tiffany. Our programs are made possible by the financial support of these sponsors. Now, our program today, the format is going to be the usual one. Following Rochelle's presentation at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, we will have a 15-minute question and answer period from written questions submitted by audience members. Um, you have cards at your desk where you can write your questions, and our volunteers will pick them up at this time um, to, be, uh, to be asked. <laughs> Uh, please silence your phones at this time um, or any other electronic devices. I would also ask that if you must leave early, that you do so quietly and without disturbing others. <laughs> okay, I would also like to note uh, that, as you'll see, we are using paper products uh, while the kitchen is undergoing some renovations. We thank you for our, your understanding with this. I would like to introduce now Mr. Hugh Ferrer. He is IWP Associate Director um, and Fall Residency Program Coordinator who will introduce Rochelle to us. Well, thank you, Sandra. <laughs> Uh, as many of you know, the International Writing Program, like the ICFRC, strives to foster international understanding. We conduct year-round programming in the U.S., online, and overseas, but our primary forum is the Distinguished Fall Residency Program, which brings writers from around the world to the University of Iowa campus for 11 weeks of writing, research, conversation, translation, public engagement, and barn dances. <laughs> <laughs> this year we have 34 writers from 33 countries with us, and they've been bringing a staggering array of interests and talents to our public events. I encourage you to follow us on social media and to look at our website where you can find all the writers' biographies as well as samples of their writings and a calendar of events. Uh, as it happens, we're coming to the end of the first half of our residency. Uh, we'll be having uh, a screening this evening. Uh, our Nigerian writer, Samuel Kolawole, is curating a screening at 105 Adler. That's the journalism building. That's at uh, 7.30 tonight. Uh, the movie is uh, the Nigerian film October 1. And then on Friday, we're, we have two filmmakers with us this year. One is Poland Lee from Cambodia, and the other is Biamba Sakia from Mongolia. Both wonderful guys. And um, they're going to be screening their short films at 5 o'clock on Friday at the Becker Communications Building, the round building right next to the uh, University Main Library. Then we'll be on hiatus for a week uh, until the Iowa City Book Festival, uh, which is October 1st through the 4th. And I hope you'll come out and see some of the many panels that the International Writing Program writers are going to be on, especially on Saturday, October 3rd. Uh, this afternoon, I'm pleased to introduce a marvelous poet, short story writer, and activist uh, from Mumbai, India. Rochelle Patkar is the author of the story collection, The Arithmetic of Breast and Other Stories, and her first poetry collection, My Song, Beneath the Sound, is due out this December. Her work has also been widely anthologized online and in print volumes. She's a member of the core team of Poetry Couture, a group that curates open mics and readings in cafes, <coughs> libraries, and art galleries across India. She's the co-editor of Nisa Magazine, has several short story projects, and, uh, and though I forget the name of the film, is also 
a budding actress. Please join me in welcoming Rochelle Potkar. Thank you, Hugh. And maybe um, you meant not an activist, but an actress. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you, Sandra, for, for this. Uh, I would like, um, would like to thank all of you for being here, and I'm very happy the meal is over because the topic that we're going to be discussing today might not be so easy to digest. All right, I must start by saying this. I'm not a social worker, but a fiction writer and poet, and I must have been interested in children a long time before I became a mother. I was planning to write a novel on children someday soon, and so when I was presented with this opportunity by Hugh, it, it happened to be that day when a disturbing image was doing the rounds on the internet. It was of the two-year-old dead boy on a Turkish beach. His name, Aylan Kurdi. The headline read, Humanity Washed Ashore. To me, it wasn't the Syrian baby that I saw that day. It wasn't an immigrant baby. It was just a baby, and the image made me want to talk of children. Because I come from India, and because of my limited knowledge on the situation of children, I have collated some of it, and yet I know that grown-ups world over have to be accountable for its 2.2 billion children in the world today. The subject of child rights is so vast that I'm not sure from where to, I was not sure from where to begin. And as I sat flummoxed in front of my computer, I thought that a perpetrator of child abuse wouldn't think like me. They don't ask themselves whether they follow rules, norms, lines, be it the law of the land or the tick of conscience. So why am I thinking so much? So I've scanned uh, uh, reports uh, from CRI, that is Child Rights and You, uh, Human, Human Rights Watch reports, International Labour Organization, World Reports and UN Reports to present this to you. What is childhood associated with? Dreams, a toy, the mist in monsoon, the last ray of dawn before it swells, yolk yellow. India is home to 430 million children, roughly one in five of all children under 18 in the world. But from the moment they are born, the challenges many of them face are staggering. At least 1.7 million children die before the age of five every year in India. Malnutrition means that almost half of those that survive are stunted and 43% are underweight. The government estimates that 40% of India's children are vulnerable to threats such as trafficking, homelessness, forced labor, drug abuse, crime, and I need of protection. I will quote Frank Warren here, who says that it's the children the world almost breaks who grow up to save it. And this from Dalai Lama. Look at children. Of course, they may quarrel, but generally speaking, they do not harbor ill feelings as much or as long as adults do. Most adults have the advantage of education over children. But what is the use of an education if they show a big smile while hiding negative feelings behind it? Children don't usually act in such a manner. If they feel angry with someone, they express it and then it is finished. They can still play with that same person the following day. Let's start with child labor. I must say that these photos are not, they are just representational and they are not uh, in direct connection with what I'm presenting, but these are all photos of child labor. The cases of child labor are too many, so I will pick a recent one that came to light in India when the police and the labor department officials rescued 400 children in a series of raids in the leather tanning and the plastic factories in Hyderabad. The children, mainly boys, hailed from India, India's Bihar, Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal states. These are India's poorest areas. These children were forced to work for 12 hours in a day without respite, in deplorable conditions, despite a nationwide ban on child labor. Many of the children were suffering from skin and other diseases as they were forced to work in unhygienic and unventilated dark rooms. 
Their employers would monitor them with video cameras and any child who stopped working would be beaten. The police arrested five men accused of supplying children to the factory owners. They discovered a mafia had brought children from other states to work in hazardous industries. India has laws aimed at fighting child labor by making education compulsory up to the age of 14 and prohibiting their employment in hazardous occupations. But despite the laws, abject poverty still causes children to be pushed into work with factory agents promising wages to their parents. These rescued children were now returned to their homes in special trains. There are numerous real life stories and, and the only other story I, I picked for this, for this sharing is a, a story from Tara Projects is of, a, if, of 10 year old Amreen of Firozabad. Her entire family, including her, worked in a bangle making factory. They were involved in various stages of the bangle making process from straightening and designing bangles with fire flames, to designing bangles on a grinder, to glass blowing and color with paints. She and the other children would be given a black chemical to put on bangles and when it was baked, this chemical looked like gold. She was not sent to a school, but of course she did go in the evenings to this uh, a center run by Tara Projects where she learned math, songs, Hindi, Urdu and English. The hazards of working in a glass factory range from bronchial asthma, watering of the eyes, skin irritation and diseases, tuberculosis from gla gas, uh, glass blowing, leg pain and back aches and because of the long hours of work. The 2011 census found that 4.35 million children between the ages of 5 and 14 were employed across India. Indian statistics show that 80% of the working children are based in rural areas and three out of the four of these children work in agriculture as cultivators or in household industries, most of which are home-based employments. One in every 11 children in India is working. For the global statistics, the global number of children in child labor have declined, thankfully, to one third since the year 2000. It's, it's currently at 168 million children and more than half of them, that is 85 million children, work in hazardous conditions. In case of children, one aspect of their life automatically intrudes into the other aspect of their life because they are not adults to keep, keep this separate. So if they are working for 14 hours in a day, they are out of school and probably they are not even going to a night school, and they are too young to take things in their control. The right to education is enshrined in the Indian constitution, but though the situation is improving, there are still 8.1 million out-of-school children, according to the survey done in 2009. <coughs> now we come to the subject of education. Again, there are plenty of cases, but I will only talk of the seven-year-old Gudia, who, according to her friends and teachers, was a very bright student, in her third grade of school. Unfortunately, she couldn't continue her school after the demise of her father, who was the sole breadwinner of the family. She had to choose between her books and starvation, and she decided to help her mother by earning a livelihood and also supporting the education of her younger brother. So her life then included, at a young age, to beg and collect money, that is 20 rupees at, the, at, the, at a road crossing, which was this Mehroli Badar, Badarpur crossing. Next, she would go to clean dishes at Mrs. Sharma's house. And then she would need dough for the evening meal. I must say this, in India, labor is cheap and most of the middle class homes have some, someone come in to do their floors, their clothes, their dishes. A child labor in cases of household jobs happens in such a covert way that if a maid is unwell, she will just send her daughter, who might even be 10 years old, to do the dishes. And most Indians rarely find anything wrong with this. 4% of the children in India never start school, 58% don't complete primary school, and 90% don't complete secondary school. The world statistics are 31 million primary school pupils dropped out of school, an additional 32 million repeated a grade. 
While girls are less likely to begin school, boys are more likely to repeat grades or drop out. According to a UNESCO report, 61 million primary school age children were not enrolled in school in 2010. Less girls than boys are sent to school. But forget the spiritual or the humane sense, this doesn't even make economic sense. If India, India enrolled just 1% more girls in secondary school, our gross domestic product would rise by $5.5 billion. Educating girls can break the vicious cycles in just one generation, yet millions of girls aren't sent to school. This is a, uh, this is a picture of um, uh, the children who get uh, midday meal facility which takes away the economic burden from their parents who, uh, who don't have to pay fees because the schooling is free and even the meals are free so they don't have to worry about that. That is an incentive to send them to school. Child marriages. India has the highest number of child brides in the world. 47% of girls in India are married before their 18th birthday. Currently, only 60% of the births from these child brides are even registered. I will sh I'll share a Mahua story with you, which is sent by, um, sent by my fiction writer friend, John Matthew from Mumbai. Mahua was married when she was nine to a boy who was 10. She hardly spoke a few words to her husband who died a year later. She became a widow at the age of 10 she was given a white sari to wear and all her jewellery was taken away. She was returned to her family at the age of 11. She was not allowed to remarry, study further or find a job and realize that living the life of a widow in a Hindu household is hard. She was given food but no money. She couldn't attend weddings and other social functions as she was considered a bad omen, a bringer of bad luck. She holds on to her religious faith as the only source of hope. Mahua sings religious songs and reads the Gita and does household work like cleaning, sweeping, cooking. She has no position in society and her relatives ignore her. And she is resigned to, to living such a life hereafter. Child marriages still take place in some parts of India in spite of cases like Mahua's. The Indian government has fixed the age of marriage for women at 18. However, this rule is ignored by some communities and child marriages are prevalent. There is all, this is also a sanctioned form of child sexual abuse that the people practicing it don't think about. The UNICEF report cited 720 million women around the world alive today were married before 18 years. This compared to 156 million male. One third of these are in India. And this brings in issues of early and frequent pregnancies, which can have a devastating consequence on a girl's health. It encourages the initiation of sexual activity at an age when the girls' body are still, girls bodies are still developing and when they know little about their reproductive health. Child brides face higher risk of death in childbirth and are particularly vulnerable to pregnancy-related injuries. It is extremely difficult for child brides to assert their wishes and needs to their usually older husbands, particularly in negotiating safe sexual practices and the use of family planning methods. They also face pressure, social pressure, to prove their fertility. When a girl marries at a, as a child, the health of her children suffer too. They have a greater risk of infant mortality, morbidity and stillbirths. And newborn deaths are 50% higher in mothers younger than 20 years of age. The world statistics show that one third of girls in developing countries are married before the age of 18 and one in nine are married before the age of 15. If the present trend continues, 150 million girls will be married before their 18th birthday, and that's an average of 15 million girls each year in the world. We come next to child sexual abuse. When I was reading the, these reports, they were so disturbing that I had trouble picking the least nightmarish case 
and even that is no less a nightmare. Children are sexually abused by relatives at home, by people in their neighborhood, at school and in residential facilities for orphans, and by other at-risk children. Most cases are not reported. Many are mistreated a second time by the, by the criminal justice system that often does not want to hear or believe their accounts or take serious action against the perpetrators. I will talk of the case of a government residential facility for girls in Allahabad, the Shiv Kuti Shishu Griha. This was a home for girls between the ages of 6 and 12 years of age, and they faced sexual abuse by an employee for over 15 years, and it was only discovered by chance. Cases from homes in other states of India were studied, where alleged abusers were members of the staff, other, uh, older children, and outside visitors, including police officers. At home, it's, it, it's the rape by fathers, uncles, brothers, or rape by neighbors. What is saddest is that when these cases are reported, the police are so insensitive that, and they are mostly dominated by male police officers that they, e they are either told not to report such cases in order to save their shame, in order to save them from shame and dishonoring their family, and they are mistreated even further. The, treated meted out, the treatment meted out by the hospital is worse. Then there's ostracism by the society. This is one nightmare unfurling into the next. Studies suggest that more than 7,200 children, including infants, are raped every year, and experts believe that more cases go unreported. The world statistics uh, of 2009, uh, with 65 studies done from 22 countries, found a global prevalence of, of child sexual abuse to be 19% of females and 7% of males. And then we come to child trafficking. Um, I'm just going to read out three cases. 16-year-old Manju was trafficked from Delhi when she was 12. Manju's parents were daily wage laborers with five children, and they agreed to send the teenager to the city after a local agent told them that she could get a good job there. But instead, Manju's, Manju was taken and sold to a much older man. The deal was 50,000 Indian rupees, which is 800 US dollars. The deal had failed, and because of that, the agent demanded more money. That night, the agent raped Manju, and because he was very angry with the money he had spent on her traveling, he cursed her and blamed her for the failed deal. The next morning, the agent sold her as a domestic worker for about 35,000 rupees, which is 560 US dollars to a, a, a Delhi household. After 11 months, she asked the agent to send her home. Instead, he locked her up in the office and raped her again. Almost a year and a half later, Manju was rescued by the New Delhi-based NGO uh, uh, called Bachpan Bachao Andolan, Save the Childhood Movement. She is now fighting a legal battle to get the agent uh, convicted for rape and trafficking. The second real-life story is of 21-year-old Vinita, who had lost all hope of ever seeing her family again. She was trafficked from a tea garden in northeast India and sold as a bride to a 50-year-old man for 70,000 rupees, which is 1,200 US dollars. When a rescue team made up of NGO workers and police found her almost a year later, she had been held, held captive and she almost broke down. She said that every attempt of hers to escape had failed, and when they caught her, they beat her mercilessly. And then there is the 16-year-old Mossami, who was found three, years, uh, three, three months pregnant when she was rescued by her abusive employer's house, from her employer's house. She had been sexually abused and denied contact with anyone. She said that she had to work for 14 to 16 hours in a day, and what she got after that was abuse. A year later, when she was back in her, back at home with her family in her village at Lakhimpur in Assam, Mosami said she had lost the desire to live. She said she almost never left her house, fearful of what people would say about her. Hiding her face behind a veil, she said, I feel very lonely and want to kill myself. I guess that's the only way out of this misery. For these girls, recovering from the trauma of this horrific past is extremely difficult. Once back in their villages, the girls 
uh, face silent discrimination from the societies and the villages they are in. Despite, despite being that their rescue comes through huge struggle and a legal battle, the lack of government policies to uphold their fundamental rights, they face the danger of being victimized again. Though children constitute one third of India's population, our country has repeatedly failed to uphold the rights of children and the situation of our children. It remains dismal at all the child rights relation, relation indicators, that is education, nutrition, health, development and protection. I would quote Tom Robbins from Still Life with Woodpecker, who says that it's never too late to have a happy childhood. A lot of work in India has been, has been done in the field, in this field to bring that childhood back, or salvage an adolescent from turning into a fissured, broken adult. There are numerous government departments and ministries, voluntary organizations, and NGOs working around children. I would like to talk about a few activists here, and I think you all might know many of them because they are they are very well known. Kailash Satyarthi is an Indian, Indian child's rights and education advocate and activist against child labor. He founded the Bachpan Bachao Andolan, which is Save the Childhood Movement, in 1980 and has acted to protect the rights of more than 83,000 children from 144 countries. It is largely because of his work and activism that the International Labor Organization adopted Convention Number 182 on the worst forms of child labor, which is now a principal guideline for governments <coughs> around the world. His work is recognized through various national and international honors and awards, including the Nobel Peace Prize of 2014, which he shared with Malala Yousafzai of Pakistan. Om Prakash Gurjar is a former child laborer from Rajasthan, who won the International Children's Peace Prize for, two for 2006. At the age of five, he was taken away from his parents, and for three years, he worked in the fields. He was rescued by the activists of the Bachpan Bachao Andolan. After completing his education, he helped to set up a network which is known as Child Friendly Villages. These are places where children's rights are respected and child labor is not allowed. He also set up a network that aims to give all children a birth certificate as a way of helping them to protect them from exploitation. He says that registration is the first step towards enshrining children's rights, proving their age and helping them from slavery, trafficking, forced marriages or serving as child soldiers. Professor Shanta Sinha is an anti-child labor activist of international reputation. She is the founder of MV Foundation. She headed the National Co Commission for Protection of Child Rights for two consecutive years, two consecutive terms. She's also won the Padma Shri and many awards. She's an acad academician with Hyderabad Central University. And her contribution is phenomenal, phenomenal especially in, in the reduction of child labor in nearly 500 villages of the Rangaredi district in Andhra Pradesh. And then, Dr. Sunita Krishnan, social activist and co-founder of Prajwala, an NGO that works for the rehabilitation of sex workers and their children. Her passion for social work became manifested when at the age of eight, she started, she started teaching dance to mentally challenged children. By the age of 12, she was running schools in slums for underprivileged children. At the age of 15, while working on a neo-literacy campaign for the Dalit community, Krishnan was gang-raped by eight men. This incident served as an impetus for what she does today. Ms. Krishnan works in the areas of anti-human trafficking, psychiatric rehabilitation, and social policy. She has worked relentlessly to bring about a change in the attitude of India's government for victim-friendly policies, as well as awareness regarding sex trafficking, through political, legal, and media advocacy. Her organization, Prajwala, has an international reputation, and Ms. Krishnan is regularly consulted, not only by the Indian authorities, but by United Nations and the US government. 
her bio data while i was reading i found it is too vast to put into even to put into four paragraphs but dr sunita drafted recommendations for the rehabilitation of victims of trafficking in andhra pradesh which has now become a state policy besides her legal advocacy and media outreach measures and her ted talks she also uses films as a tool for advocacy she has scripted 14 documentary films on issues such as youth hiv aids marriages incest prostitution sex trafficking communal rights krishnan has been physically assaulted 14 times during her work and she receives regular death threats and this is what she has to say <coughs> i have this deep rooted belief that my life is a providence by itself and god has brought me in this world to do what i am doing and god will allow me to stay in this world so long as he believes that my mission is not done and therefore i do believe that the day god believes that my work is done i will be killed or i will die naturally or whichever way that is possible in conclusion we owe it to our 2.2 billion children of the world in our own ways possible and we owe, we owe it fast before they turn into adolescents which in which is just a turn of few years being an being a poet incorrigible i would like to end this presentation with three of my poems that in some way relate to what we are discussing here timely don't pick a wilted flower even graves are dressed in fresh ones heart beating petals over dead bone and you ask me to wait have you ever seen a rose red ripe and raw like wine does it wait its turn in the bouquet its time and place is the morning when from the blessings of a stem it oozes nectar life juices strumming from its veins after that a bookmark in the pages memory aromas in translucent perfume bottles don't ask a rose to wait there is no time in its petal only the saga of one sunrise and one sundown the second poem <coughs> anthropology 2 a human child isn't a gallus gallus they say to stand up on its feet in a month after birth and feed on worm from earth a human child has to stumble procrastinate its gestation is more than what's in the womb for each thought and word to form like limb it needs to grow fall learn brim and upturn like a cup waiting for use on an empty restaurant table hollow as a bell jar it has to crack and bleed <coughs> powder to brutality be given a hundred chan a hundred chances to err a thousand to forgive and even when it grows up the human child is still learning to unlearn remembering to forget and re-remembering a new with new words this childhood lasts until old age in a long journey from self love to self hate to self love and only when this child achieves enough vulnerability empathy more than it can handle it grows old and an old human cries like a baby with the slightest of a kind touch and the last poem we joined her on a late evening a boy dressed in creased pajamas walks home with his mother she weaves his frail hand into hers and in a silence that can be heard they stride under the dance of the moon tomorrow the child will be pulled pulled away again from his bed tucking bundled into new clothes and sent back to the crash with a rucksack to be bathed cleaned and fed his mother would merge into the morning stream returning after a thousand hours of travel and a 14 hour work shift this invisible tread 
between mother and son, growing easy, each expecting no more from the other, the son from the crash, or the mother from the world, that grows larger and longer in front of them. Thank you. Rochelle, I want to thank you, truly thank you for a very powerful presentation. Um, at this time, uh, if we have any questions, our volunteers will be picking them up and we will begin the question and answer period. Um, at, I would also like to remind you of our upcoming programs. On Tuesday, September 29th, Ray McGovern, former CIA analyst, who prepared the President's daily brief for Presidents Nixon, Ford, and Reagan, and Colleen Rowley, UI Law School graduate and former Chief Legal Officer of the FBI Minnesota office, who was a 9-11 whistleblower, presenting, Can We Wade Out of the Big Muddy and Get Back to Some Moral High Ground? On Thursday, October 8th, Eric Tate, Assistant Professor at UI Department of Geographical and Sustainability Studies, presenting on monsoon harvests, water sustainability and rainwater harvesting in South India. On Wednesday, October 14th, we will welcome another IWP uh, author to the ICFRC, and that uh, the announcement on who that is will be coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> what solutions could be implemented and which ones most easily be put into effect and how can the US people help I mean uh, I would need to really research on what a lot of NGOs are doing and uh, I don't think I would be able to collate these answers right now but um, I think uh, United Nations is helping and uh, American organizations are helping a lot of a lot of NGOs in India and a lot of volunteers come from from America to India so I think th there are a lot of collaborations but if you want specific details, I would need to collate this information, which would take me a lot more time. <laughs> yeah. What are the major barriers to improving the lives of children? Ah, this is a better question because I can answer it. <laughs> um, I think uh, it's, the, it's uh, the societal mindset, because in India we don't wince when we see we don't wince when we when we see children working. I mean, we don't even uh, we we like to beat them up, uh, you know, as a methods of discipline. Whereas in uh, I think in America you can't touch a child, right? I mean, you can't you'd be jailed. But uh, in India we beat them up. So the, although we love them a lot, we do love them a lot. But our love is very different. When we, in this I'm, I'm talking of disciplining. So even there we have different. Uh, different ways of how on uh, different techniques of parenting um, but I think generally talking about this subject uh, uh, of child abuse it's the mindset of the society which is uh, very closed like no one really talks about incest and people are coming coming out now only now because of the social media because of uh, more articulation and assertion but for very long, uh, nobody knew what was going on because it was just kept quiet and hushed because the, the parameter that is attached to this is, is a family dishonor. It is not about how fractured you are getting as an individual, but it is looked from the outside as family. Don't dishonor your family, so don't talk about this that's happened. Just keep quiet. So I think it's the mindset then, then uh, the missionary, uh, the, the police missionary and the, and the judicial systems are not very, uh, very sensitive to, uh, to matters such as these, uh, whether it be crime against women or against children. First of all, it is believed that the, children, that the child is lying. 
they don't believe children because because children come from a world of imagination and imaginary friends so for a long time it's not even believed that they could be they could be saying something meaningful so i think a lot of mindset needs to shift from not worrying about how dis, uh, whether you're going to dishonor your family okay uh, or not and uh, the police uh, the judicial system and the society at large because once you are out there and you are abused and you speak that out in public the society has a very regressive way of looking at you as a marked or branded person and i think that in itself isolates you so i i i have always in india we've always observed that uh, you you are raped once and then you are raped again by the society and you're again you might be raped again by the media who will not respect your your privacies and even um, you know like uh, have your name out you know so it doesn't respect anything so you are raped many more times by by these other systems Apart from the activists noted, are there influential religious leaders or celebrities speaking out on this issue? Uh, leaders, uh, like political leaders, uh, I have not, at least to my mind, I don't think notably anyone. Um, in fact, uh, I don't know. Some of them have been, uh, you know, behind these. Behind these, in in some of them have been. you know behind these so that's a kind of a, a, a very dark place but uh, celebrities do speak about especially the celebrities who have faced child sexual abuse they now come out and speak about it and because so many follow them uh, it's now become it it gives the other people courage the other victims or survivors courage to speak about it so yes but, but i wish we had much more of that happening we don't have as much of it happening what is the rate of immigration from india to neighboring countries by children or does such a thing never happen legally are there any statistics on illegal immigration to neighboring countries well i don't have the statistics on paper but there is a lot of trafficking going on with uh, in the developing countries i think the mm, from from nepal india and and all the neighboring countries the the basic uh, fact of the matter is that wherever wherever there are families or neighborhoods that are poor and they have no fixed source of income or like or whether they you know they are they don't have um, if they have farmlands and it's not doing well they don't have fixed jobs then these people are more likely to to sell their children or hand their children over for for some money which they need that money is like the respite so uh, and the the agents can do anything with the children in fact there's also something like uh, not just buying them from parents uh, and the parents sell them with good faith but there's also something like like a huge mafia of kidnapping where children have just disappeared and they have been found or tra traced later many years later working in factories in very uh, very deplorable conditions so yes in all poor and developing areas uh, trafficking uh, is is i mean this is prone to trafficking all the time but i can i can dig up the statistics are saudi abuses as you described allowed to continue in order to maintain the existing social hierarchy if you mean the social hierarchy with uh, respect to caste uh, that too adds to adds to the menace that is already unfurling and uh, uh in fact it's even worse when uh, you know they say that there's a totem pole for even victims the ones who might be abused in a city versus this one who might be abused in a rural area the one who might be of a higher caste or well connected and maybe a dalit a dalit who is of the lowest caste or 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 other low caste might not even we might not even hear about their cases and uh, so yes in that sense um, the more powerful get a voice and and the other people are not heard and a lot needs to be done about this because 
that there in itself there's a discrimination of who gets heard and who gets covered in the papers, who is closer to the justice system and who's not. So yes, that uh, that social hierarchy is is very prevalent, and uh, uh, the mindset is that the lower caste, you know, you can do anything with them. So. Positive and or negative consequences of Modi's and BJP's rise to power. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I just, <laughs> that's a very heavy question. Um, I, this is not, uh, I, I would not see this much in terms of uh, child labor or child uh, sexual abuse in, of what I've spoken about. I think uh, uh, the BJP or, the, or the, the current political situation has, has other, uh, you know, has connections to do with other things, uh, lots of other policies, but I think uh, they haven't, uh, I mean they have supported, supported the policies that are happening here. I've not heard of that. I've heard of uh, other religious uh, problems and <laughs> conflicts and other sorts of things, but not not here. So here we are. Our children are safe. <laughs> All right. Do you think there is a popular or moral framework available to overcome these cycles, or will change only come through economic arguments, such as you cited with education for young women? Um, I wish we could even even drive this this economic argument down. I because uh, when uh, when parents sell their children or when they send their children, you know, for some money, they do it for an economic reason. So sometimes that is exactly what will work for them to tell them about the economics. Otherwise, if if they didn't do that, uh, there would have been no need to talk about economics. If, uh, but I feel we should talk about anything that works. If economics and money works, then that's what has to be told to save a child. But otherwise, if, if we don't talk about economics, uh, I think this is going to take a long time. There, there, are, there are a lot of NGOs, a lot of social workers working on the field. And there is change, but, but that happens very slowly. It's like for every one child saved, there are five children, ten children in difficulty. And so many of the cases don't don't get reported. So I think uh, it's a mindset shift that needs to occur, and that is going to take time. I think that is going to take repetition. That is going to take literature and films and talking about this in in the common rooms, in the dining rooms, talking about this everywhere. This is not going to happen overnight because, as I said, uh, child labor is even so covert that. In India, we have so many children working as domestic help and we don't even think twice about it. So we need to question it at a very basic level about where all you're seeing this. In some places, it's, it's almost invisible, but I feel um, the social mindset will be what will work at a macro level and which needs a lot of work and, and regular repetition through films, art, movie, books, literature, what have you. And uh, if that doesn't work, then sell the economic concept. Because when a, when a parent is at that edge and nothing else works, then it's only the money that will talk. And that's why we have, we have uh, you know, support, support, monetary support so that the children go to school. Because that's what, that's what cuts the deal. Thank you. Um, we are down to our last question, and I, hopefully this is a lighthearted one. Um, how and why did you choose to become a poet? Wow. Thank you for that. That is easy. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No, all the questions were interesting, but this one was the best. <laughs> okay. So um, I didn't choose to be uh, a poet, but uh, I think poetry chose me. And I will say this because I always wanted to always thought of myself as a short story writer and if you wake me up in sleep or you throw water on me 
and say, introduce yourself, I'll say I'm a short story writer. Yeah, so I will not even say a novelist, I will not say an actress, I'll not say anything, I'll say a short story writer, because I love that form. And uh, I didn't, I, I don't think eight years before this, I could even tolerate poetry. Uh, I was very impatient about this. And it was only when I ate a lot of fiction and produced a lot of short stories and fiction that I realized there was a lot of food, but there was no water. And where's the water? And I started searching for water. And I think poetry was searching for me then. And poetry is water. So I think we both found each other. And I found poetry in 2013. So it's my new love. <laughs> Thank you very much. We now conclude our program. On behalf of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, I give a big thank you to Rochelle Potkar for her presentation. I also thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs and the University of Iowa's Honors Program and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. Again, we also thank today's financial sponsors, Midwest One Bank and Dave, Denise, and Mike Tiffany. Rochelle, as a small token of our appreciation, we would like to thank you with the very coveted thank Iowa you. City Foreign Relations Council mug. Thank you. I'll have my first coffee in this. Yeah. <laughs> thank you again for joining us. We are adjourned. <laughs>